Hello, this is Cheryl Arkell for the Better Reading Podcast, brought to you by Belinda Audio, B-O-L-I-N-D-A dot com. Today we're speaking with Hugh Remington. Hi, Hugh. Hello, how are you? Hugh has been a journalist and a foreign correspondent for nearly 40 years. You really don't look that old. During that time, he's been thrown in jail, shot at, threatened with deportation, witnessed massacres in Africa, and witnessed every kind of natural disaster. He has reported from close to 50 countries and seen with his own eyes wars and conflicts in four continents. He's got a book, it's called Minefields. It's the compelling account of his life, from a small town teenager with a drinking problem to a multi-award winning journalist. He's been known to say, if you go looking for trouble, you'll probably find it. It's true. It is true. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, 40 years. I've been following your career for a long time. You are. Mm. Time passes. I started very young. As a journalist, I started very young. And often journalists did, didn't they? They started as cadets, at, yeah. you know, after they left school and before they went to university. Yeah, and that was, I mean, the, you know, I was a... Uh, I decided when I wrote this book that part of the reason for it was to write a book for my kids uh, so that they could understand what their dad had been up to, which I think I'm, I'm an old dad. I've got three primary age children. I've got an older, older daughter as well. But uh, part of it was to, uh, I think kids get a better understanding of themselves when they have a better understanding of their parents. And in yeah. fact, I'm delighted to say that it's already worked because when I got the first copy of the book at home, I was uh, driving my son home from school and I said, look, there's, there's the first book and he picked it up in his hands. He's an eight-year-old. And he was reading the blurb on the back and he suddenly look, mm. looked at me in a kind of an awed look on his face and says, Dad, have you been to jail? Mm. <laughs> and you hadn't told him that before. Yeah, so I said, I think you're going to find some things out about me that you didn't necessarily mm. know. And he said, well, not for a very long time, maybe mm. just for two years he ventured. Mm. And I said, well, it was a lot shorter than that. And I started to explain the story. But basically, you know, I was, I was a kid... I wanted to write in there and I thought I had to be honest about it. I was a somewhat lost teenage kid. Mm. I, I, I was drinking far too much. I was drinking. How old were you when you were drinking school. too much? Oh, 15, <gasps> about 15. Right. So I was literally drinking uh, before going to school. Right. And I wasn't doing great things for my school marks. And, and so. But where I, were you getting alcohol at 15? <clears throat> well, you could earn money through yeah. little jobs around and about. Like I worked in a hamburger bar and so on. Mm. And um, and so there was enough money around to just keep going, and I knew exactly where to buy the cheapest whiskey or whatever it was, mm. and I knocked that and, off. And that was hard. It wasn't beer; it was whiskey. No, yeah, I was drinking whiskey before school. Yeah, wow. And you know, and it, it was not going unnoticed by the teachers. And I was really going. I was really a bit of a messed up kid. There's no particular reason for being messed up. I had loving parents. It was, you know, the, you know, just the way of it. Mm. And so at the end of school time, I. Um, I, I had no idea what I was going to do, and I was working as a hospital cleaner. And in fact, I managed the, the book tells the story. I managed to actually stuff up even being a hospital cleaner, because I was using one of those pieces of machines that polishes the the floors. And I was doing this at a teaching hospital in the town where I was living. And uh, one day I was finishing off just for the night, and suddenly the the machine bust and stopped. And I thought. Oh, well, so I pulled in the big flex. As I'm pulling in the big flex, I noticed there's some sort of like burnt bit on it. Never mind. So I put it away. And the next day I turn up to work and the lift doors open at the, at the hospital and there's my boss. Did you notice anything different, anything strange last night? Uh, no, he says, in my best Homer Simpson uh, approach. You know, nothing I can recall. Turned out I'd shorted out the blood bank for the entire town. And they were putting out urgent calls for people to donate blood. So I was a failure as a hospital cleaner. Mm. But they couldn't sack me. It was a unionised force. But what they did do is they sent me to another part of the hospital where I cleaned the rat poo trays where they did experiments on animals. How old were you? I was 17. And so I was in this state. I was, I was, I was unmotivated, not with great mental health, really a dangerous habitual drinker frequently just vilely drunk and not able to hold together the most basic kinds of jobs. And I was rescued in one of those kinds of weird moments where somewhere in my orbit I came into range, if you like, of a bloke who was in, happened to be the news director of a radio station in the town. And one day someone said to me, that bloke, Tom Clark, said, Tom Clark wants to see you. 
And I, I had no idea what possible purpose this might have. And I, and I went to see him. And, uh, and he said, come in here, sit down. So I sat down. And he said, why do you want to be a journalist? And I looked at him and my immediate thought was, I've got no idea. I realised it was some sort of job interview, but I hadn't applied for a job as, an interview, as a journalist. The thought had never occurred to me. Um, but I, I looked at him and he plainly thought I'd applied for a job and I was aware that I was working awful jobs and I just blurted out the first thing that came to my mind. I said, because it would be fun. And he looked at me with quite disgust and he said, fun? And a little spark of genius saved me because I looked at him back and I said, isn't that why you do it? Because mm -hmm. it's fun? And no one likes to admit their job's not fun. And he hired me. So he didn't know you. You hadn't applied for it. No. So, no. so it was just chance. He barely, he barely knew. It was, I, I, it was plainly a misunderstanding on his part, a misapprehension. Someone had applied for a job. Some wire got crossed. He thought it was me. And so he thought he'd get me in because he thought I was pestering him for a job, which I wasn't. Some other poor sod had pestered him for a job, and who knows what he's doing today. And but I managed you, to get that job, and I've done basically the same job ever since. And that gave you the lifeline. Absolutely. Well, can I just say that I have followed your career for a very long time. I've always loved your voice, always. Thank you, Sharon. And it could be what he loved about you as well, or where he thought the talent was, because I think people's voices can be very distinctive, but also very convincing. I think that there's, I've always felt that there's an honesty about um, the way you read the news, the way you tell a story. In a world, because you were in commercial TV for a very long time. I still and am. You mm. still are. And not everybody has that. Not everybody has the integrity. Not everybody has, um, I mean, you know, I'm so tired of television because I don't mm. believe anybody anymore. So that's, I think that's a large part of it. And I wonder if that's the talent that he saw in you at a very young age. I don't know how much the voice has to do with it. These are just the, the tools that you use. And my own voice is an amalgam of a migrant life. My parents were British. I, I had a childhood in New Zealand. I've lived in Australia for my adult life, except for extended periods as a travelling correspondent in Hong Kong and in London and so on. So the voice becomes essentially a mix of many things. But the, the notion of the integrity is, uh, is central to how you want to operate as a journalist. And I have one very simple rule, and that is never say anything knowing it not to be true. It's mm. a very simple rule, but it's astonishing how the temptation sometimes to, to beat up, to color up a story. You can get things wrong. I've got, I've got things wrong so many bloody times. Mm. I've, I've said things that are false, but in the belief in saying them that I've got a fact right or that there's something else or that it's at least contestable or other things, you make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Mm. But um, there's a difference between an honest mistake and, and telling fibs. And people, you know, the, 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 in some ways the whole career progression is about trying to keep true to that one idea. You, as soon and as I you're in a position where you think that you're being required to say something, knowing it not to be true, you must leave immediately. Mm. And I've done that. Mm. But then other people don't hold those standards. One of the things which is uh, a conversation I've had many times in journalism is this notion of ratings, the, the, the mm. primacy of ratings, mm. that jobs and careers are entirely based around ratings, and they are. That's the brutal mm. you know, metric of, of the commercial world. <clears throat> and there are people who have a view that that somehow or other has primacy over the other thing. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if the vital metric for being a doctor is to make money, not to save people mm -hmm. or, or ensure their good health, but to make money. And if you assign that a value above the core competency, which is in the case of a doctor to keep people healthy, then you've got a corrupted system. Mm -hmm. And it happens easily, painlessly. And well, the same thing can happen in news and information. And you just, you know, it's very simple. Never say anything knowing it not to be true. Never say it. And one of the things about... Uh, Electronic journalism, one of the reasons why I really value electronic journalism is a lot of people in print get their work doctored up by sub-editors and editors who want to beat up stories and all that kind of stuff. Whereas the rule I realized is that no one could move my lips except me. Mm -hmm. If someone, and I've been under great pressure to say things at various times, and I just say to them, no one is moving my lips except me. Mm -hmm. 
I like that. Tell me, so that's a positive about social media um, because at the moment I'm reading it as a 24 hour news cycle that is leading the path to, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's a path to what I think is destruction at the moment because we have a world of uncertainty because we're on this cycle of news, I think. I mean, you look at what's happening in England, you look at what's happening in the US. I mean, in Australia to a lesser degree, but we're probably just gonna follow on. There is, through social media, I think, people have got a greater voice, people that probably couldn't articulate things, you know, before. Absolutely. You know, couldn't write letters to the editor, for instance, but now are using Facebook comments. Um, and I think some of that is creating the, you know, the world that we're living in now, a world of uncertainty. Talk well, to me the, about the, that. Yeah, yeah, the gatekeepers have gone. And yeah. I think I, I like to look at this with a long historic view because I, I do think that if you go back to... I like that, the uh, gatekeepers have gone. Yeah. yeah. So if, if, in a sense, if you go back to the start of human activity when you might have a, a settlement of a, of a group of people, a few hundred people, and then opinions at times of stress, maybe disease, a failed crop, whatever it might be, an outside threat, it's really the voice of the mob uh, is what conducts itself. And then within that mob, the village, the community, whatever it is, certain people will emerge who are seen to be more trustworthy. Often you'd get a religious figure who might have predicted something, what do you know, it came to pass. So extra attention is given to that view. So, but really it's, it's the unmediated voice of the mob. And, and I think what we've done now is we've reverted back, thanks to the democratization of, through social media, of, of voices, Everyone can have a say. Everyone can get on Facebook. Everyone can can get into in, you know you can you could be Donald Trump. You can get into the into the into the Twitter feed of the president of the United States and tell him he's an idiot or tell him he's a great man. Now that is totally new. And when you look at it, the media, as people of middle age now recognise it, which people think was a kind of an immutable force in 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 civilization, is in fact only had a very brief period, maybe two hundred years. And that is the period when someone came up with the idea that you could attach advertising to information. Before that, you had, if you look back to the American Revolutionary War, you had pamphleteers who would print, often with a sponsor or someone who would give them money, would print ideas, which then be handed out as pamphlets, but you needed someone who was going to give you money. Uh, and, and then someone put together the idea of the advertising, which is a separate idea, and print the two things with the news. And suddenly there was this money that could drive a totally new thing, and that was the independent journalist. And so that's what built up. It's only 200 years old, mm. where the money could f from advertising could fund journalism. Now advertising has gone away to realestate.com. It's no longer in the classified pages of the paper. Mm. It's going from the TV stations away to Facebook and onto Google search engine optimization schemes and all these other sorts of things that are going. And so the revenue is disappearing and with it comes that journalism and with it goes the gatekeeper role of journalism. So we are certainly an uncharted country. Mm -hmm. uh, the voice of the mob is back. We're back in, in the villages of, of Asia Minor, you know, 2000 years ago, that's where we are. But it's much louder and more global. But it's too loud. Well, lots of people make the choice to turn it down. Lots of people don't. Lots of people go into it for but a while and have a play on Twitter or something and then go, no, this is a little bit toxic and walk away from it. So it's quite but dynamic. But I'm looking at big picture. I think, is it leading politics? Is it leading worldviews? Is it leading, you know, um, our opinions about what we think of other people? You know, it's really interesting because if you go back again to that idea of the mob in the village square, mm -hmm. the voices that are loudest are the voices that are angriest. Mm -hmm. And the consoling voices, the conciliatory voices, blessed are the, peace, are the peacekeeper, uh, peacemakers. That's a really interesting comment, really, from a very long time ago, mm -hmm. which, was, which was injecting into sort of biblical era uh, Middle Eastern society that it is a fine thing to be a peacemaker. Um, that was quite revolutionary. Part of the Christian message, if you mm -hmm. like, was that notion of the peacemaker because it's necessary in the mix because otherwise the loudest, the shoutiest voices tend to draw the most amount of attention. And that's see, where I we think are we're now. not hearing the peacemakers as much as we should be. I, Michael Brissenden mm. was in a couple of weeks ago, um, and I was talking to him about my fear of some of the comments that I see on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and sometimes, I, you know, you you can have a look at a feed, and I'm just fearful. And he said, pretty much what you're saying, 
is the haters speak the loudest. They do, yeah. And also they speak anonymously, which is another great... Mm. It's even better in some ways to be a hater now than it was in the village square <laughs> way back mm. when because you can wear a mask while you do it, mm. and particularly on things but like that. But those that. haters create discomfort, don't they? They they create, well, I mean, let's have a look at Charlottesville, for instance. Let's have a look at how these people get together for a white supremacist rally. They hate. I often think some of them don't even know what they're hating. Well, I think it's really interesting because Charlotte, there are two things going on there. One is there's a virtual process where haters exist in a world like Twitter. They can do it anonymously. They can go and have a crack. The trolling is really quite appalling, but it can also happen between school kids using, you know, it, it's everywhere that you can go. There's this unmediated, uh, unthought-through explosion of your own vileness. Um, it certainly gets a voice, whereas previously that didn't happen. Mm. But then if you look at Charlotte, Charlotte's, Charlottesville was an interesting... It's Charlotte, isn't it? Uh, it is it's a Charlotte. It's town, yeah. yeah. So not Charlottesville, that was another thing. But the, So Charlotte... Uh. Um, oh, sorry, did I get that wrong? No, 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 I, ca yeah. I can't recall at the moment. We're talking okay. about in the in, in uh, this this big battle over taking down the Robert e, the, the the statue of Robert E. Lee, and then, of course, and then yeah. what happened, and the car goes yep. flashing into the crowd, and the neo Nazis are running amok, and so on. Um, what's interesting in that is that that is where that um, world of haters build up communities, and in that case, they started to emerge as a physical thing. So they're out of their bedrooms or wherever they're sitting there being keyboard warriors and they've turned up physically into one space and it becomes an actual physical clash between people in, in a specific place and yeah. time with those ideas clashing. What gave them the confidence to come out? Is my question. Is it is it social media? Well, it's a combination of things. Social media is certainly part yeah. of it. It also happens that there is a president who many of them feel is much more sympathetic to their point of view than previous presidents have been. And so there is a, a feeling of being given um, license to, uh, to be bold. There's also this belief that you see in extreme groups that they are speaking for, an, for, a, for a, uh, a silent majority. And so therefore when they put up their banner and they, and they actually come out into physical space, then everything will change because suddenly the armies of their supporters will emerge. And what's really interesting is that these are important times and, and these are real battles of ideas. I remain optimistic. I could be a complete fool on this. But I've always felt that the better arguments lie with those who are generous in their spirits mm. and, and that people are appalled by in a Western tradition particularly, are appalled by people who come up with racist and really vile approaches. But I have to square that off against the fact that genocide has existed in every culture. Uh, it's Forever. existed in it's existed in, in Europe, in the middle and the heart of Europe, it's existed in Cambodia and East mm -hmm. uh, in East Asia, it's existed in Central Africa and then in a variety of names has existed everywhere else. So there's obviously a, a human capacity for awful things to be done. And it starts with language. It starts with the dehumanizing of an outgroup and then builds a momentum. You see it with the, with the way, the treatment of the Jews, you see it with the way in which the Tutsis uh, were, were radio in Rwanda kept up a constant vile thing against Tutsis, calling them cockroaches that had to be stamped mm. out. Mm. Um, you could see it in in Cambodia and the way in which the enemy was structured in a certain way. And then <laughs> there were you know, intellectuals, anyone with glasses. So it starts with language, and you've got to be really careful about language, and you've got to be alert to it. I always, fight. I, and naively, I guess, of course, as I was growing up, and when I was studying or learning about these atrocities, I always thought that progress would teach us something, that history would teach us something. But what I am seeing now is how quickly that can happen again. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, history keeps on rolling around, doesn't it? And mm. one of the great things about reading history the, is yeah. that you keep on seeing these, these little mirrors being reflected back at mm. you from where you are. Mm. And, and one of the questions, one of the, one of the challenges is that these, this vigour, there was great vigour in the Nazis, they're a vigorous force, 
is great vigor in some of these neo-Nazis. They're physical, they're masculine, they you know, they march, they want, they, you know, they talk about violence, they talk about taking mm. back their nation. There's all this kind of stuff. It's vigorous. It seems the language is about battle and, and mm. it's positive in the way in which it's framed. And the counter-argument to that is, is something which seems kind of a bit soft and a feat in comparison. Um, it, the language doesn't exist to, to battle extremes, mm. ex except in sometimes the vaulted language that you hear, the sort of the Thomas Jefferson type of language that, that still exists around. But you, you have to keep taking it back. A society has to keep taking it back to what makes itself important to itself, why the society mm. exists. And Australia, which I firmly believe is a fantastic society by and large, mm. Um, needs to keep reminding itself of what makes it great. Mm. It's kind of working here at the moment, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I often wonder, are we going to follow the footsteps of Europe and the US or are we one step removed at the moment? And why are we one step removed? Because we're as involved in the social media news, the 24-hour mm. cycle, just as much as everybody else. And, and some of the, many of the same issues are the same. We, yeah. We've had one good thing going for us and that is that we have an economy that is has ticked along quite nicely despite mm. all the ructions mm. in the world for you know for a generation and that that is you know if the economy was suddenly to drop down and stay down then then the temptations for there to be uh, you know much less social cohesion would become very strong mm. and it's not insignificant that um, when you see whether it's Stalinism or Nazism uh, it emerges out of a time of economic turmoil mm. and uh, you know, I don't think we should be too complacent about how things should mm. go here. Mm. And I think one of the most important things is that we is that we constantly, through small ways, reinforce the structures of of community and of, of common feeling among people who share this space with us all the time in small mm. ways, mm. because that's a resilience that we need to have against whatever awful day there might be that things start mm. to go nasty. Mm. Gosh, you. Very interesting conversation. I'm enjoying this very much. And me, Cheryl. Now, tell me, um, we'll go a little, I, I just want to talk a little bit about your career. So, you then became a journalist. Mm. And what happened? You were like a traditional journalist working for the newspaper? No, I, I started straight off into radio. Straight and, into radio. And, and then I, I worked, I went up to Auckland where I did a, a brief, I was paid actually to go on a, on a six month training course, which gave me some Fantastic. typing skills, <laughs> useful stuff like that. I mean, it's kind of a miraculous turnaround. You could oh, have gone huge. either way, couldn't you? Absolutely. And the, one of the weird things about it, I, I sort of make a joke about this, but it's dead true. I was saved from alcoholism by journalism. Yeah, wow. Well, that said about because absolutely no so one because <laughs> <laughs> journalism has been a great creator of alcoholics down through the years. But suddenly I had a job and I had to go on the on the radio. And, and you had purpose. I had a purpose. And and I also realised that, like, I was growing up in Christchurch, New Zealand. There was You were at the end of the world. And to travel anywhere, particularly in those days, was enormously expensive. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I, I, I realised that there were two things. One is I could actually learn through journalism how the world works. And I thought that was an interesting And you experiment. must have had a curiosity. Oh, absolutely. There is yeah. nothing. Curiosity is yeah. hugely underrated as a yeah. motivator. Yeah. Uh, just that desire to find out. And the realisation, a little light went on, that if I played this in a particular way, I could get someone else to pay for my travel. And what do you know? They did. And that's attractive, isn't it? Oh, as yes. a young fellow. And that was yeah. exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And so I was able, I've had this incredibly privileged life. Mm. And and I wanted to find out how the world was in my time. But of you life. were good but, in your job. That's why the privilege was there. But but I don't it's funny you say that because I started off as a as a as a cadet who knew absolutely nothing. So if I was good, it was a mystery to me. Uh, you know, for some reason what I found was that some challenge would arise and I wouldn't fail that challenge. And then I'd be weighted up with a bit more uh, mm. responsibility for the next time. And so for some reason, I, I never completely stuffed it up enough to be flung. And so you build up experience in, and you get better at it. How did you get to Australia? I, I uh, was working in Auckland and my brother had gone to Perth and he sent me a little clipping out of the paper uh, the local paper that they were looking for a radio journalist. Had he not been there, I wouldn't have known in that pre-internet age yeah. that they were looking for a journalist at an obscure radio station in Perth. And so I rang the number and the guy at the other end said, well, what are you doing over there? Do you read news or whatever? I said, yeah. He said, can you read me some? And so I 
With that great the voice of yours. Yeah. <laughs> and I just read some I out loud. I would have been sold. <laughs> and he said, can you start in three weeks? And so I found myself moving to Perth. Yeah. And, and I was actually thinking at that time I'd probably go to the UK because I had a British passport. And I thought, well, Perth, that's good because I get some stronger Aussie currency than the Kiwi currency. And the weird thing about it was is I fell absolutely in love with Australia. Mm. Uh, and I write about that. Um, it, and it was the... Uh, it what was a contrast, the Perth, of particularly to New Zealand. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. If you'd landed in it, Melbourne, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The size of it, mm. um, the, the the social difference as well. There were really subtle differences. There were subtle differences in terms of well, they weren't even subtle. They were quite quite stark differences. For example, between how the indigenous New Zealanders, the Maori, uh, lived within New Zealand society compared with how indigenous. Australians lived within Australian society. Well, we've learned a lot from the New Zealanders around that. Well, I wonder whether there's not more that could be learned. I, I, I would agree with you. So, and one of the things about it is that the, you know, the, the Europeans turned up in New Zealand at much the same time as they turned up in Australia. It was only, a, mm. you know, there's a few years difference. But oddly enough, when they got to New Zealand, they formed up a treaty. They, they, one of the first things they did was, it was establish a treaty. It was conciliatory, wasn't it? More so than yeah, here, yeah anyway. more so. I wouldn't want to, you mm. know, too much sugarcoat what went on. But they... But there was a perception, partly because I think the Maori existed in uh, in settlements that they farmed, uh, and they were very territorial uh, around their areas. They had these fortified paths, as they call them, which are like fortified um, villages, and um, and they also had uh, there was no written language, but they had this very strong. Uh, oratory, tradition of oratory, mm. where things were sorted out through really what were debates and speeches. And I think the uh, the Enlightenment era Brits who were turning up there recognised those structures as being stuff that they understood. Mm. And so I think there was a greater level of of respect compared with the Aborigines who whose structures were mysterious and the, profoundly mysterious. In fact, they not not weren't even understood. The early French the who came here tried complex. much harder. Yeah, yeah. Well, the languages are complex, but so is Maori, I guess, mm. initially, to some mm. You don't speak a language, you don't speak it. Mm. But, yeah. So, okay, so then from Perth to... Yeah, so from Perth to Melbourne, and then I started to get into, into 3AW, which was then a, a very successful radio station, and it, and it had great power. And so for the first time, you found politicians and senior figures wanted to be on the radio station. So... so uh, you could call anyone at any time of the day. Say you came from 3AW or Macquarie Radio and people would talk to you. And, and, then, and then suddenly you started to get pitched into a more sophisticated world. You're up against prime ministers and, and, and treasurers and things. And then I got sent away to a coup in Fiji in, in 1987, the first coup. And um, I think that might have been the first time I saw you as a journalist. Okay. Yeah, around then. And, 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 uh, and I got arrested. Yeah. Uh, early on in the piece, and it became just for a couple of days quite a big deal that, that, mm. that this guy had thrown a job. Yeah, Others had a much worse time than me. And one of the one of the stories, one of the delight delights in this book is I've been able to extract the story of Peter Cave, who was a fine ABC um, mm -hmm. journalist now retired, who who was subjected to twice to uh, mock execution. Effectively, he was expecting to be shot at a firing squad. Uh, and he's never really talked about it, and because I know Peter, I've known him down the years. He's entrusted me So they put him the up story. against the wall. Yeah, well, first up against a wall, and then they there was some argument among the guys in the firing squad that there were too many witnesses because they were at the back of a hotel, and so they put him in a in a truck with another bloke, Red Harrison, and they took him out into the bush and put him up against some trees, and uh, and then again there was an argument. A sergeant didn't like it because he hadn't. He, didn't, he knew that it was pretty criminal activity, and he wanted a written order, and so that delayed the process, and uh, and they got out of that. I'm not surprised he's not talking about it. Mm. Mm. Okay, so from there, you've seen a lot. Yeah, so then I started to get noticed a little bit, and mm. I, I moved into TV. I worked for Hinch initially. Uh, mm. Uh, in TV, and and I didn't like that tabloid TV, so that was a, that was an early decision of, that I wasn't going to go that way. And I went into news. I got hired by Nine, which was fantastic, uh, back by a guy called John Sorrell, who was a true roll gold alcoholic, uh, a, a monster in some ways, and a brilliant man in so many others. And he gave me a break at Channel Nine, and within a couple of years, they'd sent me to London, 
And that was the absolute break. And so from there on, I started growing up in the world and started traveling a lot in Africa and Somalia and South Africa at the end of the apartheid phase into Rwanda and, um, and as well as going up into, into Russia, the tanks rolling through the streets, blowing mm -hmm. up parliament, mm -hmm. you know, the IRA was active, blowing up bombs mm -hmm. in the middle of, of London. So the Northern Ireland story w was big. You know, some hilarious stories as well, like chasing Christopher Scase through Spain, you know, which was just an absolute opportunity to eat and drink magnificently yeah. well on That's the expense right. account. You didn't, um, you didn't strike me as one of those um, 60 Minutes journalists that, you know, were eating caviar and drinking champagne while the world was falling around them. I think, you, yeah. again, I think you had a bit more integrity than that. Well, I, I, you know, I, and I, even I, if I you were, I didn't know about yeah, it. I don't, want to, I don't want to knock the uh, 60 Minutes no. guys. Some of them have, yeah. over the years have been very, Absolutely. very fine reporters. But, the, the, but they, they certainly lived better than often I did. Although there weren't bad days. You were, you, the key thing was you had money to do the story, and that mm. was all that really mattered to mm. me. But I, I was always interested in the experience of people at the bottom of power. And Africa was a huge... I sort of think of Ad Africa was my university, really, about learning about life, and and um, and particularly South Sudan, mm. uh, you know, but Rwanda, Uganda, mm. a whole bunch of things. But mm. South Sudan was an area where I where I I learned, I think, more deeply about the human experience mm. on on the planet. You've certainly seen a lot. I have seen a lot, mm. and that's now, been the great thing. And if I can just say, I went to the White House, Julia Gillard. And I remember standing there. I was I was standing in the in the Oval Office, and Gillard was there, and so was Barack Obama. And I was bantering Two of my backwards and forwards. <laughs> <laughs> I was bantering, a, a, you know, briefly. I wouldn't want to make too much of it, but with uh, with Barack Obama. And I thought, oh. uh, so I'm sitting here at the at the seat of power in mm -hmm. in the world with the most powerful man in the world. But I was very conscious of that moment of also having been in South Sudan in 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 the middle of a war, in the middle of a famine within that war, with children dying literally untended around me in mm -hmm. the dust. And, and, and I thought at that moment, I really have seen mm -hmm. the full range of power on this planet mm -hmm. and powerlessness on this planet in this life. And all of that has been a gift of journalism. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with me. Well, Hugh, um, I want to know more, and I'm sure the listeners want to know more. And if they do, they've got to read the book. It's called Minefields. Congratulations Thank on that so achievement. Thank you so much, Cheryl. A really great conversation. Yeah, Thanks thank for joining you. me. It's Cheryl Arkell for the Better Reading Podcast.